Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest today is Joshua Landis. Joshua is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. He is an expert in the Middle East. He is a Syria expert in particular. He has lived for over 14 years in the Middle East. He was brought up in Beirut. He returned to the region in the 1980s to teach in Beirut and study at universities in Damascus, Cairo, and Istanbul. He writes Syria Comment, a daily newsletter on Syrian politics, which attracts, I am told, some 3,000 readers a day. And he is a highly regarded academic and commentator in this space. He's been on all sorts of programs from Charlie Rose to Jim Lear to BBC Radio to NPR. So we're very fortunate to have him. And our conversation today doesn't just focus on Syria and the conflict between Turkey and Syria and the Kurds and Russia and Iran and all these different players, but it actually broadens into a larger conversation about the disintegration of the rules-based global order, which is something that I've been thinking a lot about. It's something that I wrote a lot about in the rundown to this week's episode as a topic that I wanted to discuss, and Joshua was very receptive to that. And so we cover that. We cover not just what does this mean in the Middle East, but what is this a reflection of? If we're going to actually see a withdrawal of American influence around the world, how does that shift alliances? And what does that mean also, let's say specifically with Turkey's entry into Syria, what does that mean for the security of Europe, which has relied on the security guarantees of the US and the US nuclear umbrella? And if Turkey decides to become belligerent, I mean, it's something that seems unimaginable now, but it's not inconceivable to imagine Turkey beginning to encroach upon European territory, starting with Greece, which it has already displayed some level of aggression towards in recent years. And we discussed that. We discussed the possibility of Greece strengthening its relationship to Russia, possibly forming an alliance with Russia. And all these things are conceivable in a world where the United States withdraws. I think Joshua's perspective differs from, let's say, Jake's, who is a reporter, in the sense that Joshua has always felt, it seems to me, that this withdrawal was inevitable. And if you read his writings going back years, it seems that his concern or his advocacy was around making it a strategic withdrawal to bring some order so that it didn't become chaotic. And I think what we're seeing now is a chaotic withdrawal. And so this is what we discussed in the conversation, as well as many other things. The overtime to this week's episode, or the overtime feed, is an afterthought segment. It's about 20 minutes or so. After the show was over, I decided to sit down and give my thoughts about the last two episodes, my conversations with both Joshua and Jake, why I think these are important, what I've learned from the process of preparing for them. The rundown for Super Nerds to this week's episode is exceptionally large because it began as a rundown for Jake and then morphed into the rundown for Joshua. And so I think it's something like 15 or 16 pages of material. And it's, I think, very useful for those of you that are subscribed to it. If you're not, As you know, I always recommend trying it out because there is no forward commitment. You can cancel at any time. Those of you who are not yet subscribed to our audiophile or autodidact or super nerd tiers, there is a link in the description to this episode that you can click on, which will take you to the Patreon page. You can learn all about those subscriptions and how you can support the program. So without any further ado, 
Here is my conversation with Joshua Landis. Dr. Joshua Landis, welcome to Hidden Forces. It's a pleasure being with you. Thank you for making the time to be on the program. When I first booked you, I wrote down a lot of what I wanted to discuss, and primarily it was a conversation around kind of establishing a foundational understanding and a context for what's happening right now in Syria and the border between Turkey and Syria and all the different players involved. That is still my primary interest. We did an episode, a recording a few days ago with Jake Hanrahan, who is an international journalist, reporter, and he filled us in on on some of that also, although I, I wanted him on to talk about more of the timely stuff. But before we get into that, if you had to write a headline to describe what's happened in the last week, what would it be? You know, uh, I was thinking about that myself, and it would really be that, you know, interestingly enough, the United States today finds itself aligned with Bashar al-Assad. Now, that seems, you know, sort of tongue in cheek, but here we are, the United States today, fighting alongside the Kurds who are aligned with Damascus, and in a sense, the Russians, in order to stop the Turkish invasion. And allied with the Turks are the Free Syrian Army forces that we were funding only a few years ago and that we were hoping would overturn Assad and take Damascus. And today, we are putting sanctions on Turkey and we're telling Turkey to stop this and those forces to stop their incursion into Syria, which is allowing Syria's troops to rush into places like Menbij. We just handed Menbij over to the Russian troops. We had a controlled handover to the Russians, who are, of course, Syria's great sponsor. So in a sense, we've come, you know, 360 degrees on this, I guess, in the sense that Obama eight years ago said Assad must go. Hillary Clinton said the same thing. They supported the Syrian rebels who became too Islamist, too extremist by 2014, and in a sense spooked America. America withdrew their support. And ultimately, this was a decision to allow Assad to survive. When Russia came in, sensing that American weakness, America said nothing. Obama said, we're not going to go to war against Russia for Syria. And then we switched to the Kurds. When ISIS grew so big and took over much of the rebel-owned territory in Syria and became, in a sense, the most powerful rebel force in Syria, America switched against the rebels and took up with the Kurds, who have traditionally been allied with Assad. And today, you know, the Kurds broke with Assad, broke with the rebels, because they hoped that America would help establish an independent Kurdish state in northeastern Syria. Today, those hopes that were raised by the United States have been dashed. President Trump, in his very rash decision, decided to yank American troops, letting the Kurds down with a great thump, Kurds all saying they've been stabbed in the back. And immediately, the Kurds, in a few days, initiated an alliance that had been hammered out over a year ago with Assad and said, we're going to take second best. And that's to go back to Damascus, put Syrian troops up the border, and try to stabilize Syria in much the same position it had been eight years ago. And so in that sense, I think the headline has to be that the United States, in many ways, is siding with Assad against the Turks and against the Arab Islamist rebels who are trying to take land in Syria. So the headline would be, after eight years of fighting Assad, we've decided to join him? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, we're not joining him because we dislike him tremendously. But in a sense, strategically, we've aligned in supporting his reconquest of all this territory up to the Turkish Is that border. a way of saying that it's all for naught, that what we did for the last seven or eight yes, years has been absolutely. primarily a waste, a wasted effort? And it's not only been wasted, it's caused tremendous destruction in Syria because America poured in well over $10 billion into Syria and into military, into opposition forces. That's not to mention 
our allies, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey, all of whom we, in a sense, wound up to take on Assad. And if you recall, Hillary Clinton in the opening days of the Syrian uprising went around to Turkey, to Qatar and others, asking them to take the lead in this effort to drive out Assad. And so, you know, America has a lot of soul searching to do, it seems to me. So I want to also ask you if we've actually made it worse because of our reputation, the damage that America's reputation has taken as a result of how brashly we left the Kurds to basically fend for themselves and cut a quick deal with Assad. And also, I want to ask you what impact this has had in terms of our fight against ISIS because we decided to take a particular strategy in order to defeat ISIS. And now, as I understand it, the Kurds have had to basically let lots of fighters escape and families of ISIS fighters escape the prisons that they were held in. But I want to take a quote from an article that you wrote, and I think it was in 2012, and it kind of speaks to this. You write, with America's economy in the dumps, its military badly bruised, its reputation among Muslims in tatters, and its people fatigued by foreign wars, this is no time to intervene in Syria. Washington has no staying power if things go wrong. It wants regime change on the cheap to bomb and withdraw. And if things go wrong, will we leave the Syrians in the lurch or get sucked into another complicated quagmire? The administration can ill afford to leave a failed state behind in Syria or to have it unfurl into civil war. That quote, that what I just read there seems remarkably prescient. Is that where we are today? It is. You know, America has made things worse in Syria. There's no doubt about it. And as you, you know, opened up, not only has it made things worse, but we have really scored an own goal here because we have ditched the Kurds, ruined our reputation with allies, but now we're putting economic sanctions on Turkey. So we've got the worst of all worlds. We don't have any friends left in the region as we withdraw. You would think that if we were dumping the Kurds out in front of the Turks, we would at least gain something from Turkey, get them to give up Russian missiles, the S-400s, get them to move away from Russia in some way. But we haven't gained any of those possible benefits. Our reputation is in tatters. And today, President Putin of Russia is swanning around the Middle East. He's in Saudi Arabia today with a royal welcome because everybody distrusts America. Everybody is looking to Putin as a statesman who can mediate their flashpoints with Iran, with Israel, with Turkey. And he's the man of the hour. And in a sense, we're, the United States is wearing the dunce cap today. So I want to ask you about him also, because it seems that there are three players that are the front of this civil war in Syria has expanded. It's expanded now with Turkey's invasion. Also, as you said, it's empowered Russia as a player in this domain. You don't hear much about Iran in the news, but I think this is also another great victory for Iran. And it seems also that not only does this administration not have a policy, a coherent policy, but it almost feels like its policy is to smash things. Because the withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal makes no sense in the context of this decision to just brashly pull troops out of Rojava. I mean, help me make sense of this. Was this always inevitable because the US body politic was never going to support an endless occupation of any sort, even a small force contingency they wanted out? Was this always inevitable? Yes. You know, I think it was not inevitable. You know, we unfortunately have a bad habit, and we have for a number of decades now, of inflating the expectations of local peoples in the Middle East. We've done that in Afghanistan, promising that we would get rid of the Taliban and set up a, some kind of decent government there. We did this when we rolled into Iraq in 2003, and President Bush promised to reform the greater Middle East. He made a big, wide-ranging speech in London in which he promised that he would bring democracy to Iraq and it would cause a domino theory and a dictatorship and tyranny throughout the Middle East would begin to collapse. And then we did it again, of course, with the Kurds in Syria, 
promising we would be there for the long haul, that we wouldn't let them down, and that they would become a strategic you know, a fortress for the United States in the region, and thus that we would help them to some form of independence. In all of these cases, we've been unable to deliver. We promised way too much, and we've let people down, and that's the fault of the entire foreign policy establishment, which somehow has taken its rhetoric and its idealism much too seriously, and its ability to alter distant lands and societies in a way that they're not capable of doing. Are you troubled by the fact that there has been no self-reflection whatsoever during the course of the last seven days and even up until then? I mean, it seems to me that every time something goes wrong in the Middle East or something goes wrong with American foreign policy, everyone just sticks to their position. The hawks just want more intervention. It doesn't seem to be any accountability for all the past mistakes. Sure, Trump has acted seemingly irrationally without any kind of strategy, but Trump didn't get us here, right? So are you no, troubled by that lack of self-reflection by the foreign policy establishment? Absolutely. And I fight it every day going what on is the reason shows for it? With... What, what is the reason for this kind of like bunker mentality? You know, part of the reason is that we don't pay for it. You know, I went on PBS News just the other night and I said something like, you know, Trump's desire to end these endless wars is very popular. And I used the example of Oklahoma where people want better schools and better roads and they don't want to suspend, you know, $5 trillion in the Middle East. And I got tons of emails and phone calls from people saying, Oklahoma is a taker state. They don't pay as much taxes as they get, right? And they've got a point. Oklahoma is a very poor state. But the point I think that I would make is that all of America is a taker society because we have not paid for these wars. That $5 trillion that we've spent on Afghanistan and on Iraq, on Syria and other places, Libya, has been borrowed. Nobody is paying for it. And that is one of the main reasons that the foreign policy establishment can get away with these sorts of adventures. Because, you know, America has this incredible credit rating and it's borrowed over $20 trillion, which our children are going to have to repay. So we're getting to do these fantastic experiments on the cheap, at least it's on the cheap today. That's one reason. The other reason, of course, is that our politics has become increasingly more corrupt. Special interest groups have bought chunks of foreign policy. And you see that most profligately with this administration. But it's not just this administration. This administration is just a little bit worse. Can you give me some examples of that? Yes, I can give you examples of that. I mean, you look at our Saudi policy, you look at our Israel policy. You know, somebody like Bolton for the National Security Council who didn't jive with Trump's foreign policy. Trump said he was going to end these Middle Eastern wars. Bolton was the exact opposite. He wanted us to get us in deeper on the Iran As a neoconservative. Thing As a neoconservative. He wanted to bomb Iran and have regime change. Just what President Trump said he wouldn't do in his campaign. And, you know, it turns out that the way he came to attention of Trump is not just that he spoke with tough language on Fox News. But he called from Sidney Sheldon's office in Las Vegas, a big gambling billionaire, very pro-Israel, who liked Bolton because he was pro-Israel and anti-Iran. And, you know, I don't know whether Trump made some kind of transactional deal in which he said, okay, I'm going to let this guy be national security advisor for a number of months because... Sheldon Adelson is giving over $100 million to the Republican Party for campaigns. But it wouldn't shock me if that kind of transactional policy is going on. But you, you see these interest groups pay to play from one end of Washington to the other. And, and people become very cynical. And I think that's why Trump is president today, because the American people feel that Washington is a swamp, has become terribly corrupt. And now they elected the wrong person to clean up the swamp. But, you know, 
I guess that it goes to the naivete of the American people, but they do feel that something is desperately wrong in Washington. Well, I have a question about that because one of the things that Jake brought up in our previous episode, and I've read something to this effect as well, is that Trump has certain business interests in Turkey, and so he's more naturally aligned with that country than he is with the Kurds. And it just got me to thinking, generally speaking, about how much corruption exists across the political spectrum. And if we're just hearing about Trump's possible uh, ties or possible corruption because he's so despicable and so disliked within the establishment, but if this is just kind of par for the course, is this how business is done, right? Is that it is. Kind of more, more and more it's saying? done this way. It more and more it's done. And we've seen this, you know, look at what's happening in the Ukraine scandal right now with an ambassador being thrown out because she wouldn't put the president's interests over the national interests. The two towers that Trump towers that Trump has in Istanbul, the many apartments he's sold to Saudis when his incredible statement of, you know, of course we're going to do business with the Saudis. They buy my apartments, bing, 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 bing. And he makes this incredible, you know, they're good customers. And I think to a certain degree, you know, that's very important. It's important to Americans at large, but it's very important to this president who has these deep economic relationships in different places. And it underlines, I think, this, this blurring of interests between the person and the state. So do you think that the American voter who voted for Donald Trump, who supports him, supports him because at least they know that he's transparent about the extent to which he is corrupted where, versus, let's say, the kind of prototypical Democrat or Republican who is seen as hypocritical? Is that kind of one of the things, do you think, that is driving the support? Yes, I do. I mean, I think that, you know, his iconoclasm, and he works it, is popular because, you know, unfortunately, people believed because he was rich, somehow he would be immune to all these other moneyed interests and that he would somehow turn America around and dry up the swamp in Washington. Of course, that's so far from the truth and he's just another instrument in this. And But you know, we see it, we see it up and down with the Clinton fund. We saw it with the, you know, Biden's son taking these fantastical jobs at high pays for doing, you know, either nothing or gaining some influence through his father. We don't know. Maybe he's just doing nothing and these are stupid countries and he's milking them. But the point is, is that the optics of it are that everybody is playing this game in Washington. And uh, it's very hard to see how to undo it. So I want to pivot back to what we're talking about is specifically in Syria. Before we, we do, I want to ask one more thing about Trump or point to something because I saw that both of us retweeted something that he tweeted. And I, I never retweet him. And I hardly talk about him, <laughs> but I found it impossible this week. And I I mean, just, just learning about what's happened in this conflict, whatever you want to call it, it's just kind of scary because it feels like he's self-destructive and potentially crazy on some level. And he tweeted out, anyone who wants to assist Syria in protecting the Kurds is good with me, whether it is Russia, China, or Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, I don't get that. You know what I'm saying? Like in the middle of this slaughter, he tweets out obviously a complete trollish tweet. Obviously, Napoleon is dead. He's not going to help. I think underneath that tweet was, you know, people are slamming him because Assad and the Kurds are now partners. They've made a deal. And the Kurds are helping and Assad return to the borders, which of course is very damaging to Israel's interests and to Saudi Arabia's interests. And a lot of our allies who've been pushing the United States to overturn Assad are furious that ultimately America, in a sense, is turning up allowing Assad to retake all this land. So I think what he is saying is, I don't care if the Russians and Assad help the Kurds. And this returns to his rhetoric of the campaign trail three years ago yeah. when he attacked Hillary Clinton and I think did some real damage with Hillary by criticizing her for regime change and saying, you turn overturned Gaddafi, and what did you do? You turned Libya into this playground for Islamist militias. And then he realized this resonated with Americans, and then he turned on George Bush. And he said, George Bush 
started the regime change thing by invading Iraq, and he turned Iraq into the Harvard of jihadism. That's what he called it, the Harvard of jihadism. And all of Al Qaeda sort of came to Iraq. And he began, he got on a real roll there, and he ended up by, in a sense, supporting Russian foreign policy in the Middle East, which is to support strongmen. Americans' foreign policy has been based on the notion that the Middle East is ripe for democracy. Which and has also you, been somewhat ridiculous, right? Yes, it's turned out to be false. And you know, Americans argue that if you kick over these dictators, the healthy society and people will put their shoulders together and build good government and democracy in the Middle East. And Russia said, no, that's not going to happen. Islamists are going to take over. There's going to be civil war and pandemonium is going to come out. This is the worst of all worlds. Yet you need as a strong man. In a sense, Putin is just, in a sense, projecting a Russian reality. He believes that Russia needs a strong man, Putin. America believes that the whole world needs democracy and it's a God-given right. And these are two different visions of the future of society. Well, the vision you're describing is American foreign policy in the Middle East before the end of the Cold War, correct? It was to well, support strongmen. Well, it's men. a democracy promotion. Well, yes, America has supported strongmen in the past. You're absolutely right, during the Cold War. And since the end of the Cold War, and particularly with the rise of neoconservatism, where both liberal hawks and conservatives came to this notion that America can really speed up history. That's the way they think of it as sort of this ineluctable march of history. And it, all these presidents, both Obama and Bush, began to talk about people as if they were on the wrong side of history. In other words, dictators are on the wrong side of history. History is coming to deliver democracy. It's a teleological progression towards this ideal you know, Jerusalem of democracy. And America can speed it up by knocking down the doors of dictatorship. And this false understanding of not only history, but the way democracy evolves, has led America into these terrible miscalculations that have cost us trillions of dollars, which has led to terrible civil wars, which have unleashed what I've called the great sorting out in the Middle East, because these fragile states like Syria's or Iraq's or Libya's or many of the others in the Middle East are holding together societies where people have not come to an agreement on how to live together, on what sort of constitution they want, what kind of laws and rules, and the basic rules of the game, the rules of the road that help a society, like our constitution, which helps us all agree on how to adjudicate our problems. And Syria has not done that. And these dictators are holding the society together. You kick them off, and these unterrible civil wars between Alawites, Sunnis, Kurds break out, and each group tries to carve out its own state or to take over and become the dominant group. And so I don't know, there's this, this free for all. It feels uh, from what you're, I mean, I agree with what you're describing, or, or rather, what you're describing resonates with my understanding. It seems to me that ever since the end of the Cold War, We've seen in the world a fracturing of states that were carved up after World War I, fracturing along sectarian lines. We've seen it in the Balkans, we've seen it in the Middle East, and it seems that that has accelerated since the Iraq War. And Iraq was really the first place we went and we broke a country. And that has since spread, but it's remained contained within the greater Middle East. With Turkey's invasion now, into Syria, and apparently they're not stopping, they're going deeper, they're going into the government controlled areas. I don't know if you can comment on that, if it's true, I've seen it reported. That now opens the risk, depending on what happens to Turkey, that this issue begins to spill over into Europe. So I want to talk a little bit about Turkey, really, because I feel like Turkey is the player in all of this. I mean, you know, Russia has been playing the role of outside agitator for some time now. Iran, the US has been committed since Trump came into office to antagonizing Iran. Iran and Israel have had issues for a long time. The US has had issues with Iran going back to 79. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia is changing. All sorts of alliances are changing. But to me, it seems that Turkey is the biggest 
new variable in all of this. Am I touching on anything that's correct here? What would you res how would you respond to that? Well, I think you're absolutely right. The Turkish army is powerful. It's not been used very much. Erdogan, of course, has these grand ambitions. And we're not sure. Of course, Erdogan is couching his incursion into Syria as a national security issue, that he's going to stop these Kurds who are aligned with the PKK and insurgency inside Turkey. And I think most people believe that he has a much larger agenda, that he wants to change Turkey's borders permanently, and that he sees this country you know, in smoking ruins next door to him. Same with Iraq, very weak. This is an opportunity to expand. And he talks about it as a time of the brave and the courageous. This is, you know, history is in flux and one has to sort of stand, get astride this current. And one senses this sort of manifest destiny going back to the Ottoman Empire. And these are our, our lands, Mosul, Kirkuk, so forth, were stolen from us at World War I and we're going to recuperate them. And this is an opportunity for a great army and a great people who have a much greater role to play on the stage of history. And that's the worry. And that's, I think, why not only Russia is warning Turkey not to do this, but the United States has done it. And Iran has said, don't do it. Everybody seems to be very anxious that these Turkish troops could continue to roll and that once they're in, they're not going to get out. So a few questions. First of all, what are the internal dynamics in Ankara that may incentivize Erdogan to continue to do this? In other words, is this going to give him a political advantage domestically if he expands Turkey's borders? And also, how does Russia respond to something like this? I mean, Russia always wants to pick the strongest states to align with. How do all the other players fit into this? Because it doesn't seem that Turkey can proceed to take over Syria without an ally like Russia or the United States, can they? Well, the United States has opted out, but lawmakers are trying to get sanctions put on Turkey. So that could you know, rein Turkey in. Obviously, the business class is so important to Erdogan and to the Turkish body politic that if they feel that their interests are really threatened, they may you know, pull on the reins a bit. But you know, Russia has done this. It's unclear where that border could go. And I think Erdogan will want to push as far as he can and then stop and see if he can get leverage for negotiating the best outcome possible for Turkey. He wants to move and he says that he wants to put 2 million Syrian refugees into this new territory he's conquering and that he's going to return them. So he's casting this as a humanitarian effort to return refugees to their homes. Of course, these aren't the homes of most of these refugees. It's going to change the demography of northern Syria away from the Kurds towards Arabs. There are a lot of self-interested reasons for him to do this, but he has a number of reasons driving him. This Islamic wave that he's riding, I think has tremendous sympathy inside Turkey as well as in the nationalist wave. So, I mean, where do you think this ends? And how do countries like Israel, how do countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, how do these nations respond to Turkish aggression? Well, Iran is trying to lay down the law and saying that Turkey should return to the Adana Agreement, which was hammered out between Turkey and Syria in 1998, when Turkey threatened to invade Syria. Hafs al-Assad, the father of Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian president to cough up Ocalan, the head of the PKK, this Kurdish militant organization, who had been given refuge in Damascus. And Hafs al-Assad was forced to send him out of the country. And they agreed on a border strategy, which is that Turkey could pursue PKK insurgents in hot pursuit six to eight kilometers across the border. They'd have to inform the Syrian police and military. They would have to withdraw quickly, but they did have this ability for hot pursuit, which would secure their national interests, but not allow them to change the border. And that's what Iran is insisting on. It has sent some troops into the region. Russia has sent troops into the region. The United States is threatening sanctions. So it's very possible that much potential damage from this Turkish incursion could be limited if the world really mobilizes and 
insists to Erdogan that it's going to pay a much too high a price if he continues this. So is there any risk over the next several years that what has so far been a Middle Eastern conflict spills over into Europe where the Turks begin to move slightly west, perhaps in the Aegean where they've, they've already been exploring for oil resources in the territorial waters of Cyprus, for example? Well, you know, there's also all the islands off the coast, right off the coast of Turkey, which are owned by Greece. Yeah. And Greece has military outposts on some of them. And Turkey has been trying to, you know, the ones that don't have anybody on it, Turkey has been putting military elements on it. It's been challenging Greece lots of friction along those lines. Then, of course, there's the new discovery of all these gas deposits underneath the Mediterranean Sea around Cyprus. And Turkey owns a big hunk of Cyprus and Greece owns a big hunk of Cyprus. And so they're both demanding territorial waters and rights of way and so forth. And this has reanimated that old animosity between Turks and Greeks. And it could lead to some fisticuffs because Erdogan has this inflated sense of his national destiny. Well, I wonder also, because of the incompetence now of the transatlantic alliance, the problems that Europe is having with the EU and the disintegration that we're seeing of the European Union, is there a risk that the Greek government could find that it's in its geopolitical interest to align with Russia at some point in the not too distant future because of a threat of continued threats by the Turks? I mean, we're talking about an environment here with the U.S. has withdrawn, right? I mean, if this environment- Well, Greece is already doing that. Greece is already, you know, tons of these Russian mafia guys are investing their money in Cyprus and banks in Cyprus. So Greece has been helping to launder tons of Russian Well, that's money. Cyprus. Cy you're talking about Cyprus specifically. That is Cyprus. But the Greeks have been making alliances with Israel in order to try to develop a pipeway for the gas and oil that would go through Greece. But they're also trying to cotton up to Russia for the same reason that Saudi Arabia is now welcoming Putin, the first Russian president in well over a decade to go to Saudi Arabia. All the Middle East you know, you can see the metal filings around the various magnets as the balance of power changes. Well, and that's the what we're States seeing. We're seeing withdraws. a Right. Yes. As the United States withdraws from the region, countries are looking to Russia who can, you know, because were Turkey to invade Greek islands or push the oil thing and get into a fight with Greece, Greece doesn't have the military power to take on Turkey. And it will need to have a good relationship with Russia and hope that Russia's good offices can restrain Turkish expansionism, just as is happening in Syria today. It's so ironic because, of course, Greece was a major outpost of the CIA after World War II. And Greece has natural points of alliance with Russia, not least of which is their common religion of Greek right, Orthodoxy. Orthodox. Exactly. Right. So it's not- and There a, was a, traditionally a big communist party in, in Greece after the war. There was a civil there's war. There's still a huge Russia's, leftist element in Greece. Absolutely. Yes, there is. The world is going back to a 19th century realpolitik where there are not two major powers around which everybody has to align as it was in the Cold War, but there are many different major powers with the rise of India, China, Russia, America's shrinking footprint, and new countries really like Turkey growing up, we're seeing an environment much like the 19th century where the concert of Europe was able to keep some kind of, of order until it exploded. And then you had lots of vying for influence and treaties, alliances, and you're seeing the same scramble for alliances, trying to balance stronger neighbors. And it's a much more complicated world, there's no doubt about it, with spheres of influence. So that's, so I think you're, you've, we've arrived now at the point that I think I wanted to get to or where I felt this conversation was going to go when I asked you about what the headline would be. Because I feel like this event, what's happening now over the last week is, it's the first major watershed in the breakdown of the rules-based order. I feel like it's the first clear example of what happens when the global hegemon, the security provider, which has been the United States for all these decades, right. retreats or withdraws. And all of a sudden, all of these countries, all of these states that either 
assumed that the United States was there to prevent them from acting on their behalf in a particular way, or was there to guarantee their security, as is in the case. That's what's so kind of scary for me about Europe, because the entire European project has been built on the premise of the American security umbrella. You're right. And you know, a friend of mine just wrote, are we seeing the end of the American Middle East? And you know, I think that's too grand a headline, but there's a lot of truth in it. America is withdrawing. Now, I said, I don't think we are. I think we're seeing a Middle East in which there are a number of great powers competing, not only you know, world powers, but regional big powers like Iran, like Turkey, like Saudi Arabia, all throwing their weight around. They now have powerful armies and they're realizing they can use them and they are using them. And it's leading to a much more dangerous environment. And that, that I think is, you know, is largely true. The United States is withdrawing, but you know, George Bush took us into the Middle East militarily, economically, in a way that we had never been there before with all of these troops on the ground. You know, in the last month, we have bombed eight countries. You know, the American military is just so big today and it's overstretched. And I think we're going to see this retreat for years to come. And that partly is not an absolute retreat. It's because there are other powers growing up. We're but being... it's not strategic, right? That's the problem that we're seeing. I mean, the last week shows a non-strategic retreat, right? It does. I, I think you would agree that retreat, a strategic retreat is needed. And in fact, you made the argument in some of the articles that I read that this was effectively an inevitability, that in the case of the Kurds, there was yes. no way that the United States was going to be able to maintain support for the Kurds indefinitely because it was such an unpopular position that it would drive a wedge between them and all the countries in the region. But what we're seeing here is it's almost as if Donald Trump is going out of his way to destroy American foreign policy. Well- you know, he's pitching this as draining the swamp and he's trying to blame all the people around him who, of course, he's put into positions of power for being part of the swamp. And he's relishing, in a sense, lashing out at them and firing them here, there and yon, like Bolton and others who said, we disagree and he's no good and I'm not going to agree with him. So in a sense, he stages these little temper tantrums. And I think it plays well to his base, but you're absolutely right. It has thrown American foreign policy into chaos. He's the agent of chaos. He is the agent of chaos. He is an chaos. agent of chaos. But you know, there's never a good time to withdraw yeah. from Syria. And it's the same for Afghanistan. We are an untenable position in Afghanistan. We are not gonna destroy the Taliban and we're not gonna stay there forever. And when we pull a plug on that, it's gonna look something like Vietnam because the Taliban is going to sweep in and take over. And all of the nice secular people that we have been employing, training, schooling, they're going to flee the country. And they're going to be damaged badly. And it's going to be chaotic. And whether it's a Democratic president who's very careful, or a Trump who throws a temper tantrum and just yanks the plug, there's going to be a large element of chaos because we've gotten ourselves into very stupid positions around the world that we cannot afford and that don't make any sense. You know, it's interesting because in some ways, we've seen something similar with China because many people will agree that the United States needed to change the way that it engaged with China, but China was so effective at lobbying American businesses and politicians that the United States has not adjusted its policy all of these years. And so here comes Trump and he, he adjusts it. He doesn't adjust it as well as people would like, but I guess it sounds like what you're saying is it's hard to imagine that because of the nature of the interests that this would be done in, in a way that wouldn't be messy regardless, that it's something that we may want, but realistically speaking, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be messy whenever we're going to do it. And this is kind of how it's going to look like what's happening now. Some elements are, but I mean, like Iran, President Obama, I think very smartly got us out of a potential war with Iran. By scuttling the Iran deal, we're now, I think, ineluctable march towards some kind of conflict with Iran 
because we're crushing Iran's economy and they're not going to sit by and allow it to be crushed. But see, that's they're the crazy thing. Out. But that's, see, that's the crazy thing. And this goes back to the point. So on the one hand, he's withdrawing us from a region where we have a thousand troops. I mean, I forget how many people we had on the yes. ground in Syria. I think five collective fatalities in the entire time that we've been there. And he would put us potentially in a war with Iran. I mean, he pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal. Right. It, it makes no sense. It makes no sense from a geopolitical standpoint. And you know, to take on China, you know, we need to stabilize the Middle East. We need to get out of this conflict, you know, looming conflict with Iran. We need to shore up NATO and our alliances with Europe, and in a sense, develop as many alliances, even with Russia, in order to corner China. You know, we need to stay in the economic agreement in Asia because all of those Asian countries who are fearful of the rise of China wanted to have an economic agreement the with TPP, the United States. So they saying, could, right. Yes, so they could counterbalance China. We didn't do that. We needed to use every instrument at our disposal and our long history of very strong alliances and friendships with all these countries in order to, in a sense, provide a roadmap for China that led into the direction of really becoming a capitalist country and abandoning the statism that has made America question its own capitalism and fearful. Is that also a naive belief? In other words- Well, you might be right. I don't know. Yeah. But it's worth a college try. I mean, that's that's the- Well, haven't you know, we been trying though? Isn't that what we've been trying to do with China? The presumption has been that as they get wealthier, that they'll become more open. But in fact, it seems the opposite has happened. Yes, it does. We don't know the answer. You know, we're facing a real competition between two different systems, economic philosophies and systems. And this system in China is not like Marxism, you know, which was based on a faulty notion of human nature, that humans wanted to share and that they would be productive even as, you know, the state owned everything. But China has come up with a model that it seems to be working beyond anybody's wildest dreams with, you know, 10% growth a year for 30 something years. I mean, it's really extraordinary. Now, it's possible that that could all come crashing down and that we're just seeing a very extended lucky streak. Well, it also depends on where that growth went and how much of that is malinvestment, right? How much of that it is does, productive it, capacity, of course. Right, because they could become corrupt like everybody else over time because this state-directed capitalism seems to be working now. But we know that you let it go long enough and you begin to invest in stupid things and there's tons of interest, self-interested people who... Any rate, the point being that we are in this incredible competition. We need to be smart. And what we're doing today is not smart. So just to recap here a moment, it seems that there have been a number of things that, that have come out of the last week or so. One is that this has revived ISIS. And I want to ask you about ISIS because we haven't discussed it yet. Right. You said that basically the big story is that it's cemented Assad's grip on Syria. And it's also handed Russia another geopolitical victory, right? Yes. And we didn't talk about the Kurds. This has been obviously a huge betrayal to the Kurds. As you said, our position with the Kurds was always untenable, but it certainly could have been handled better, and it certainly could have been handled in a way where we didn't further damage our reputation in the Middle East. And on top of that, US credibility writ large has been damaged from all of this, right? It seems to me that these are kind of the major takeaways from what has occurred. Right. If we had been running our policy in a thoughtful way, President Trump, who wanted to get us out of Syria after the destruction of the caliphate. You know, the Kurds went, when he made that statement in December of this year, about eight, nine months ago, 10 months ago now, everybody shuddered and some people resigned. It was an irresponsible statement, but he walked it back and he basically gave his foreign policy lead another 10 months. The Kurds, on hearing that 10 months ago, went to Damascus and hammered out an agreement with Damascus, an agreement that they never acted on because they had a much better agreement from the United States. But James Jeffrey, special envoy to Syria and others, told the Kurds not to make a deal with Damascus because they were going to stay there for the long haul. They were, of course, all completely wrong. Then when Trump basically just ripped America out in the last few days of Syria. 
the Kurds had the deal. They managed to revive it within two days. I mean, everybody was stunned at how quickly this deal fell into place, but that's because they had hammered it out a long time ago. And America should have been facilitating the Syrian return to these lands, knowing that it's not going to stay, it's not going to be there to defend a Kurdish state in northeastern Syria. It should have laid the groundwork for stability in Syria and stopping a Turkish invasion, which was going to be so damaging to the Kurds and to the whole political order in the Middle East. And it could have done that. And it, it refused to do it because it didn't really know what its foreign policy was because two sides of American foreign policy were fighting each other. And we've got this chaos that's come out the other end. But we could have done this in a much more reasonable way and we didn't do it. So one of the things that you said, this word chaos, that brings us back to ISIS. These yes. types of extremist organizations operate well in environments of chaos. and. That's what we are seeing increasingly in the Middle East. What does this mean for ISIS? And what does this mean for the security of European nation states and the United States, which have seen attacks from ISIS? I don't know if we had any in the US. I guess we had some ISIS-inspired attacks, but certainly right. there have been some in Europe. This is no small threat. We managed to roll them back through our relationship with the Kurds. Now presumably they're in a better position. How much better? And what does this really mean in the next several years? Are we going to start seeing attacks again, do you think, from ISIS as a result of this? Well, ISIS has not gone away. I mean, look, this is obviously a great opportunity for ISIS. And I'm sure there are a lot of ISIS people out there who are you know, rubbing their hands together and hoping that the whole situation falls apart and Turkey and Syria get into a real fight. But if this can be contained, the Syrian government has a very long and deep interest in destroying ISIS. So does Russia, so does Iran, and even Turkey. So it's very possible that ISIS is not going to grow up again in the middle of Syria. It is obviously has positions in Yemen, in, in North Africa, in Central Africa. So it's not over for ISIS by any means. There, the Islamic extremism is still a potent force in many places in the world. But it doesn't have to be the replay of Iraq in Syria. I think you know the long-term solution to ISIS in Syria is a strong central state, a good police force, and stability. That needs to be built around a government in Damascus. Now, of course, America does not want to see a strong Assad. It traditionally has not, because that means Iranian influence. That means hurting Israel hurting Saudi Arabia. But ultimately, that's the only long-term solution for ISIS in the Middle East. So Dr. Landis, in closing, I'd love for you to give us maybe a best case and worst case and maybe even middle of the road case scenarios for what you think comes out of this current crisis and this larger crisis of American leadership and foreign policy within the Trump administration, because of course we do have one more year and we don't know what's going to happen. I don't think the Democrats have this in the bag whatsoever. In fact, I'm quite concerned by the fact that there hasn't seemed to emerge a compelling Democratic candidate who can appeal to both sides of the aisle. And I wouldn't put it past the electorate to put Trump back into office because of much of the rightly deserved hate and disgust with the hypocrisy and the mistakes, the unacknowledged mistakes of the ruling class that have unfastened so much of the ire of the body politic. So how do we forecast American foreign policy amid all this uncertainty? You know, the US is withdrawing slowly from the Middle East from this high point of the Bush, you know, sort of projection of power, which was very unnatural. America had never had that kind of power projected and couldn't afford to project that kind of power. So we're withdrawing you know, for two reasons. One is because we'd overextended. And two is because America is no longer the sole superpower in the world, which we were for about 20 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. We had this little you know, 20, 25 year period in which to play on the, the globe. And now China's come up, Russia is back. There are many other smaller regional powers that are pushing in at this as well. So 
America is going to find it much more difficult to project power. Our major interest in the Middle East today, well, we have two. One is Israel, and the other is the Persian Gulf and oil. And you know, if there was one lesson that came out of World War II, it's that you wanted to have your hand on the spigot. We defeated Germany because we didn't allow Hitler to get to oil. He ran out of oil, and his panzer units, his air force, came to a screeching halt. Germany was trying to get to oil in what Churchill calls the hinge of fate, the Battle of Stalingrad in Russia and El Alamein in North Africa. He was stopped. Now, as a result of that, the US began to think about a World War III, and they wanted to have control of world oil. That meant the Persian Gulf, where over 50% of world's strategic oil reserves or known oil reserves lie. And so, the US has doubled down on Saudi Arabia, and this is part of the reason why we have not been able to abandon Saudi Arabia. And because we don't want to cede control over that Persian Gulf oil to China or to Russia, who would move in very rapidly should America withdraw. And that has to do with our identity as a superpower. If we concede that, we're no longer going to be, you know, that's one of the major tent pegs of superpower dumb, if you want to put it that way. So America's at a very at a crossroads here. And we see this amongst the Democratic Party who've been trying to hammer at Trump for his alliance with Saudi Arabia. But in some ways they're undermining a central tent peg of American foreign policy since World War II, which is control over the Persian Gulf and this alliance with Saudi Arabia. We don't know what is going to replace that. And it's something that Americans aren't talking honestly about and haven't really thought about. This is a, you know, our relationship with Israel is another complex, traditional, you know, tent peg in our Middle East foreign policy. And the Democrats today are at sixes and sevens over our relationship with Israel. You know, you listen to Bernie Sanders or the sort of very left wing of the Democratic Party, Ilhan Omar and so forth, who are condemning Israel for its settlement policy and its rather nasty policy towards the Palestinians. And yet Israel has been a central part of the Democratic Party. You know, the vast majority of American Jews vote for the Democrats and support the Democratic Party. And the Jewish community in America is so important to politics, to intelligent discourse. So, you know, we're in a time of real flux yeah. where we have to rethink our global strategy we have to retrench, there's no doubt about it, but we have to retrench, as you were saying earlier, in a very smart way, because if we unravel things in a chaotic way, the way we've been doing so recently, we're gonna be left with enemies on the right and the left. We're gonna lose a lot of power quickly, and we don't have to do that. We are the major player in the world, and this is still American century if you want it that way. I mean, 65, 70% of world trade is done in the dollar. We have tremendous power to shape things. So America has an important role to play. We have to limit our ambitions. We have to have much more realistic sense of what we can accomplish in the world. And we have to maintain our alliances and reshape our alliances. Those are gonna be very important things for the next president. So I think you know it's not unreasonable to assume that if someone like, let's say, Joe Biden comes into office, he will retreat to the traditional strategies. He'll try to deploy some of what you're describing. If Donald Trump gets reelected, what are we looking at for the next four years in your view? Or do you think that the establishment, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, is so committed to ejecting him from office, they see him as such a threat that they're going to impeach him one way or the other? And then what are we dealing with? I don't know the answer to that. You know, I think that President Trump has tapped into some deep veins of American anxiety, not only economic in terms of the economic gap, but also identity politics. I think that many Americans felt uncomfortable with Hillary Clinton's real retreat to identity politics, whether yes. it was yeah, sure. women interests, whether it was black Americans, Hispanic Americans. You know, at the national convention, she paraded one special interest group after the next. And I think, you know, many white American men 
got very anxious. And a lot of American women got anxious because they have sons who are white American men, but also because many Americans don't want to think of their country as you know, parceled between these different It was very groups. divisive. So the Democratic Party adopted a very divisive framework for, for thinking about politics. I mean, that's what identity politics is. It is. And that's what played into Trump's hands. And you know, the Democrats today, whether it's Bernie or Warren, are trying to move away from that. And that's what makes Bernie Sanders so compelling, because he sticks to his economic arguments with incredible, you know, like a laser beam. And he is pitting the two percent at the top against the rest of America, and he's saying, "Look, at, we you know we have to fix this." And Warren is moving in that direction, but she doesn't. She has moved away from some of that identity politics language. I've noticed that she's, she's moved away tried from some to, of it. but she comes back to it. And Trump has been trying to nail her, you know, first with the uh, Pocahontas. with the uh, Pocahontas thing. But so he has every interest to make her Mrs. Identity Politics, and. And he's going to try to find a way to chisel that into her. And, you know, we'll see. Well, interestingly enough, he has exploited the incompetencies of the Democrats and the vacuum that they have created in the same way that Vladimir Putin has exploited the incompetences of the American foreign policy establishment and the hypocrisy of American foreign policy. Because that's the other thing. It's very difficult for us to make moral statements about the behavior of Russia or Iran or Turkey or China when the United States has been caught red-handed many times doing things that are totally amoral in foreign policy, whether we're talking about Abu Ghraib, whether we're talking about the- Killing a million Vietnamese in order to- Yes. Sure. No. Yeah. There's no doubt that- that America is capable of being very self-serving. It's hard to know who the good guy is when it comes to American foreign policy sometimes because the rhetoric is very lofty, but the record isn't really so pristine. It isn't. And American power has been abused a lot in the last 20 years. We had that sort of glowing record of the victory in World War II and a good causes and the great generation and all that. And today, Americans have a much deeper sense of self-doubt, I guess, both economically in terms of the way their own society works and the way that they can use their authority in the world. So Dr. Landis, before we end it, maybe you can give us a silver lining here. If you gave us an optimistic outcome out of all of this, what what can we take away to feel good about the future? Well, I think America holds wonderful lessons for the world. We still are an incredibly successful society. You look at our education system, the whole world, particularly in the Middle East, if you name any school the American school, everybody wants to send their kids to it. People believe in what America has put together, a multi-ethnic, multicultural society that is ruled by a civic nationalism rather than an ethnic nationalism that can produce fantastic institutions and learning and progress. That model is still the envy of the world. And not a China, not a Russia have found something that can really replace it. It has become tarnished and America's in a sense casting about for a more restrained vision of its place in the world. But I think there is a lot, you know, there is so much that's good in the American model that needs to really be highlighted and that should act as a real future for the world because we're seeing the rates of migration. The old national idea of you know a Switzerland or a sub Sweden, excuse me, that's all Swedes or a Germany, that's all Germans. Immigration is going to change the face of nationalism in the blink of an eye. And it's doing it and it's causing you know great backlash of this nationalist backlash. But it's happening and America has a good answer for that which is a way to integrate people with this civic nationalism and how that can make you stronger. And I think that's, that's a model that we need to hold up to the world as a countermeasure to some of the darker, more atavistic nationalism that we see. Well, Dr. Landis, I really appreciate you making the time to speak with me today. Thank you so much. No, it's a pleasure. Very good questions, very uh, challenging. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. 
For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.